Hello, and welcome to the RPG Academy Twitch channel. My name is Michael, and we're here tonight for another episode of Detention Live. Joining me, as always, is my co-host, Chris. Chris, say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. And then joining us tonight is our special guest co-host is Garm. Garm, say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. I haven't been in detention since junior high school. Well, it's been too long, and now you're you're overdue. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with you or your work, uh, give us a quick elevator pitch. What is or who is Garm? And then I know you do some podcasty stuff, so kind of tell us a little bit about it. Uh, hi, I'm Garm. I am a Canadian, I guess, TTRPG creator, uh, TTRPG content creator. I don't write games yet, um, but, you know, such is the way everybody does eventually. Uh, mostly, I interview creators over on YouTube at Midgardia RPG. I used to do actual play stuff. I might again someday. Uh, and I also write articles for Two Minute Tabletop about, you know, weird fantasy cities that you can use for your campaign. Very cool. You were actually one of the people that was very kind to me when I was trying to promote Action 12 Cinema. I actually think you might have been the first interview I did specifically for that game. I've been on a bunch of podcasts over the last, you know, 13 years for different things, but that was my first Action 12 Cinema. And I wanted to say thank you. And I was happy to have you back on our show and hopefully return the favor a little bit. Oh, I was glad to have you. It was a fun time. All right, so we're going to jump into our show as we uh, always do with our extracurricular, and this is where we just talk about what we've been up to. It's usually related to gaming stuff, but not always. It can be work, family, movies, TV, just really whatever you're willing to share with strangers on the internet. Uh, and Chris, I'll start with you tonight, buddy. What you been up to? Uh, still, still playing a lot of Diablo Four. Okay, um, gotten really into that uh, in between work and other activities. Uh, still doing the Shadow of the Demon Lord, or uh, sorry, Shadow of the Dragon Queen. Yep, the different, Ooh, different, different system completely. Uh, I've been liking that. Uh, last week I had, or last game we had, Clay wasn't able to make it, so the party got to meet uh, Fizban, the old crazy wizard who secretly is actually a god. And I had to rewrite some of the modules, so it's kind of fun to do that. Um, other than that, I, you know, haven't done a ton. Said. Diablo 4 seems to be taking up a lot of my free time. Well, that is a lot. Uh, you know, as long as you're having fun, again, you're doing it right. I will say yep. that the the audio only of your campaign is going to start, I think, next week. It's going to be in July for sure. I believe next week's when those are going to okay. start, and there'll be weekly releases. Hopefully that they'll just maintain throughout. We've got enough of a buffer built up. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, things happen, so that may not exactly work out. But uh, I'm looking forward to that as well. All right. So Garm, I'll go to you next. Uh, what have you been up to? They just want to feel like sharing with people things that you're interested in, new stuff, whatever you want to share. Sure. Uh, mostly I've been playing Cassette Beasts, which just came out on the Nintendo Switch. It's a monster tamer where you record weird monsters with your cassette tape and then transform into them. Hmm. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> it's got like a you know kind of cute Game Boy uh, art style. It's nice. I've been enjoying that. And uh I've also been listening to some old uh, Star Wars audiobooks, the Coruscant Knights trilogy, or quadrilogy, mostly. Okay. It's been fun. It's uh, it's nice. I, a lot of the old Star Wars books are pretty decent. Well, some of them. These yeah. ones are. <laughs> there are some that are really, really good, and then there yeah. are some that are not. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm also gearing up to go to an anime convention this weekend. Oh, so very cool. Which, be fun. which yeah. one? Uh, anime thon up in Edmonton, Alberta. All right, a little, little far for me to get to, but I'm, hopefully you have a good time. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so again, speaking of the Star Wars stuff, again, uh, Chris, did you see the Ahsoka trailer? I did. Uh, lots of questions, and I'm going to, uh, you know, do what I usually do and reserve my thoughts until it actually happens. It so looks reasonable. really good. Yeah, <laughs> it looks really good, but so did Book of Boba Fett. Yeah. And. Everybody in the, that's listened to me knows my theory on that one. Yeah, it was yeah. a fever dream. Uh, anyway, okay, so Garm, I'm sorry to cut you off. Did you have anything else you want to share? Because, I mean, you feel free to elaborate as much as you want on anything you want to talk about. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I like, I like <laughs> Star Wars. Uh, I haven't I haven't seen much of the newer stuff, like the, the live-action TV series. I've seen none of, uh, unfortunately. I should get around to that, but I am just horrible at watching anything that's come out in the last 10 years. I'm like, no, I'll watch this anime from like 1983 instead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I My tastes are questionable. I will say that. <laughs> I mean, again, as long as you're having a good time. Yeah. Exactly, right? I would encourage you to watch Andor. If you watch oh my God. Andor and Obi-Wan, 
those would be the two I would say to watch. That and the Mandalorian. Don't bother with Book of Boba Fett. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I would also say don't even bother with Obi Wan. I didn't care for it very much. But Andor is like one of the best shows. Mm-hmm. Not not Star Wars, just flat out one of the best shows I have seen in a very long time. It was amazing. Really loved that one. Yeah, yeah. I've heard a, a lot of really good things about Andor. I just uh, haven't had the the attention span to sit down and watch like an hour solid of uh, actual episodic content as opposed to like clips of live rescue or something yeah no i I totally i get it uh we do have a few people that are hanging out with us for the moment so welcome uh lurkers are always welcome to be here but if you would like to chat with us we do really enjoy that and at the end of the show we have an audience q a segment if you want to stick around or drop back in usually we end up like roughly an hour uh we'd love to have you talk to us then uh so as for me i've had a bunch of stuff going on i will try to run through some of it quickly because there's so much of it uh but a catacon stuff is starting to gear up so um I've ordered dice. I've ordered the tokens. I have the t-shirt finalized. Uh, I've been buying some games. I spent five, six hundred dollars in the last couple of weeks just on new games for the Acaticon game library, including uh, Blood on the Clock Tower, which I got mm-hmm. to play at Lexicon with my youngest, Jacob, when we went to a con recently, and he loved it. Like, he really, really dug it. It was a bit much for me. I I think I would like the game under different circumstances. Uh, again, but th- th- there's a bunch of people playing it. We had two games going on within one room, and I have hearing issues, and I'm also dumb. So there's a lot of stuff that happens. I'm not sure I kept up with what I was doing and how I was contributing, but we ended up winning. Uh, so yay, but uh, he really, really loved it. And I know a lot of people online, I'm on a Discord that plays it regularly. Uh, I just knew it was a game that would get a lot of attention, so I bought it. And yeah, m- immediately on the on Facebook, several people were like, oh, thank you for buying that. I can't wait. I'll, I'll run it for you. Uh, you know, I'll run it at the con. So I, very excited to get that. Uh, I recently bought a game called Remix, which had, there's a Marvel version, which is the one that I bought, but apparently it's based off of another um, game. Uh, so Scurvy Knave and the Hawks Blade are joining in. Thanks for being here, both of you. Appreciate it. And uh, we played with the boys. Really liked it. I, have either of you ever played Remix before? Mm-mm. Nope. So it's a very simple game. But it, it, there's a lot of synergy and strategy. Basically, the Marvel version is you've got heroes, allies, equipment, conditions, and locations. And then you have villain cards. Villain cards are their own separate deck. Each card has a point value. Some of the, point, some of the cards also have tags like um, Asgardian, Super Strong, kind of like uh, Legendary. You have like those subcategory sort of yeah. things. Um, and then they kind of synergize off each other. So... You basically get six regular cards, you get one villain card, and you count up your points, but your villain card may say, this card is not worth anything unless you also have two equipment. Or you might have like, I think uh, the Black Panther card says, this card is worth seven, but it's worth four for every other Wakandan card you have in your hand. And then another card may say, count X cards twice when calculating your score. And so you just have all these different, like trying to figure out which are the best of the cards you have. And then on your turn, you can either draw from the hero pile to get another hero ally condition, location, or or equipment, or you can draw from the villain card, or you can draw from the discard pile. And you can draw any card from the discard pile, not just the top one. And the game ends when there's 10 cards in the discard pile. So if you're basically playing two Hmm. players, you roughly get five turns each. Uh, So you're just drawing cards and then reevaluating, trying to get a good synergy or maybe trying to like, play the odds of hopefully getting this thing that you need. And you can only score if you have at least one hero or ally and one villain. So you got to have at least one villain and either a hero or an ally in your hand. Uh, So it plays really quick. It's really fast to get into, but there's actually quite a lot of strategy behind like when you go and what you go for. And uh, there's some like pressure luck, like your last card, do you take something off the board? You can see that you know how it will affect your hand or do you like draw hoping you'll get something that will be better uh, so I've actually really enjoyed it, and I think it's one the wife will enjoy too. So we we went went to play it, and then didn't happen. But I think that's when we're going to get to the table quite a lot. So uh, very happy with that purchase. Mm-hmm. I drove down uh, in this process of buying all these games. I drove down. I live in Southeast Kentucky. Uh, Skip Trip is with us as well. Welcome, happy to have you here. Uh, yeah, there's good. a there's a really nice game store in uh, the West Apple West Town Mall. Sorry, the West Town Mall in Knoxville. It's like an hour and a half from me. And that's usually where I go down there and, uh, and buy my games. Um, and then I found out there's also a place called McKay's. 
just happened to see a billboard for it. Advertising works, folks. And it's basically like this giant used store. It's like a used bookstore on like super steroids. They have video games, computer stuff, old LPs, comic books, puzzles, books, and then just games. And their pricing model makes no sense. Uh, I found things there that were unopened that were like 25% of retail. Like I'm, because I, I do that. I'm that jerk. I'm on my phone. Like, how can I get this at, you know, on Amazon? And it's like cheaper than Amazon. And I usually buy it. Uh, and then I found other things that were like opened and like rubber banded together. No idea if all the pieces there, like more than what it would cost to get it new. So I, I don't hmm. understand, but I kind of feel like it's that, that sort of like yard sale mentality where it keeps you looking. Cause like mm-hmm. right around the corner, there might be another bargain. I easily could have spent eight hours just walking that store and I didn't have that much time. So I'm, I plan on going back just to hang out at that store uh, soon. I really, really had a good time there. And I, I bought like $80 worth of like random stuff for prizes for Catacon. So a lot of Catacon stuff. Uh, quickly, I saw Indiana Jones and Dal Desti. That was pretty good. Didn't think it was amazing. Didn't think it was better than the Last Crusade, which is my personal favorite of the original three because I don't count the fourth one doesn't exist uh but it was good i mean i had a good time i had no problem watching the theater i ate my popcorn you know it just it was absolutely worth my matinee money to see it in the theater i recently watched bear season two have either of you watched the bear at all i watched most of season one that show gave me anxiety attacks and i (laughs) i I mean and really i I suffer from anxiety and depression on, on occasion it might be one of the best shows I've ever seen just flat out, but it is hard to watch because it is so well made. And in season two, there's a different level of like the anxiety, but it's still like I couldn't watch more than like one episode at a time, no matter how much I loved it, because I would be like, like just not comfortable in my own skin. I finally got through all of it and it was so good. Absolutely. One of the best shows, you know, highly highest recommendation for a, a show. Uh, and then I guess I just, I didn't hear, I rewatched bullet train last night, the like last year. Um, it's the Brad Pitt, uh, mm, action yes, movie on yeah. the, on the train. I saw that one. It's fun. Like, again, is it high art? No. Is it die hard? No, but it's a good, which it's a little long. That's his biggest problem is it does wear out its welcome a little bit, but I absolutely had a really good time watching it. Highly recommend that one as well. So mm-hmm. uh, Fox Blade agrees that uh, the, the point of the show, it seems to be on the bear is just to cause stress. And it does that very, very well. All right. So that's oh, um, Spider-Man. I'm, I'm pretty playing the Spider-Man game to get ready for the new one that's coming out in October. So with that, we're going to move into uh, our first improv game. And this is uh, 10 things is we're going to take turns prompting each other in turn to come up with a list that fits the prompt. The idea here is immediacy is better than accuracy. So a list you come up with quickly is better in terms of the game than a list that actually makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. Uh, Garm, you are the guest tonight. So you get choice. Do you want to go first in terms of prompting Chris or I, or do you want to go first in terms of being prompted and giving your list? Uh, do you want, I'll go first with prompting just because I got one ready to go. Uh, all right, all right, Chris, give me 10 wilderness creatures. Oh, oh, all right. Uh, phew, raccoons, one, they have thumbs, by the way. Uh, possums, <laughs> two, deer, three, uh, ducks, four, rednecks, five, but ding, 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 uh, ding, 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 uh, campers, six. Uh, let's go with bears, seven, let's go with reindeer, eight, uh, mongoose, nine. Why did I say nine? And... Nine. I don't know. All right. Uh, and uh, let's go with something fun. Let's go with an anaconda. Ten. That was, in fact, a <laughs> list of ten things. All right. Let me do one thing here. Our chat is actually filling up, and my thing wasn't moving. Uh, there we go. Oh, and I didn't what? didn't do the thing. I'll look at that. Nope. There we go. Okay. So, Chris, <laughs> you will now prompt me, and then I will prompt Garmin. That's, that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Michael. Uh, ten things you like about the Star Wars or Star Wars, the Spider Man game. That one. Uh, swinging through the city is just fun. One. I like the leveling system and how you get to choose where your points go. The the skill trees. Two. Uh, the voice acting is actually very very good. Three. Graphics are solid. Four. Um, the variety of challenges. Five. Uh, the the actually the the version of the Spider Man story is. Different from the comics canon, but it's actually really well done. Okay, six. Um, I like uh, the 
fight the fight system, like how you do combat. All right, seven. Um, I like that you don't spend a lot of time with Mary Jane and Miles because that's my least favorite thing. Since you don't do a lot, I'll count that as a positive. Eight. Uh, I said swinging already, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The the just going really high and looking off of buildings. All right, nine. And I like it when I get to throw people out of cars and then web them to stuff. Man. Yeah, that yeah. was a list of 10 things. All right, uh, Garm, you mentioned multiple times anime. You're going to anime convention. I'm sensing a theme. Give us your top 10 anime. Uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion. One. Uh, Cowboy Bebop. Two. Uh, noir. Um, oh, God, you're hurting me. Uh, <laughs> Sinful Gear. Four. Um, my brain is completely locked. Uh, Chainsaw Man. Five. Did I say, did I say Gunsmith Cats already? Yeah. I feel like Gunsmith Cats. Okay, Gunsmith Cats. Six. Uh, oh, God. Uh, Star, the Star Wars Visions Anthology. That counts. Seven. Um, Outlaw Star. Eight. Uh, Samurai Champloo. Nine. Oh god, I'm so close. I've I've almost uh Macross uh let's go with let's go with Delta. Macross Delta. Ten. That wasn't yeah, ten. Was the ten, ten things. things. Congratulations. I got that. Good job. You got that. <laughs> All right. So now we're gonna move into used books. This is kind of like what I call the meat and potatoes of the show. We're gonna take a look back at a campaign that one of us ran or played. And the idea here is that we're looking for lessons learned. Maybe something we tried that worked really well and we've taken it with us into future games. Maybe we tried something and it failed spectacularly and we learned not to do it or we try to do it differently in the future. Garm, you are the guest tonight. Do you have a campaign that you can talk about, please? Yeah, uh, continuing the Star Wars scene that we seem to have going on, uh, mm-hmm. a couple of years back, I ran Star Wars Saga Edition as uh, what we would call, I guess, an open table game, although that was not a term I knew at the time. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was called Fragments. It was Clone Wars stories with just whoever happened to be free when one of our other games fell through. So, you know, it was like mission based. Everything had to be resolved in a single session, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, It's the longest running campaign I've done, actually, in terms of like sessions. Uh, We had players make some of them made Padawans, some of them made Masters, uh, that kind of stuff, which got a little weird. when One of the Masters showed up for one session and then never again. But uh, yeah, it happens. Um. One thing, Clone Wars. Yeah. yeah, it's the Clone Wars. It happens. We've we've all been there. Um, one thing I was particularly proud of that went well with it is every Jedi character. I made them take a dark side uh, ability right at right character creation. I gave it to them for free, but the temptation needed to be there because mm-hmm. you know no one's going to take that on their own. They will all want to be goody two shoes, and uh, they managed to. Like they got in several horrible scrapes where relying on the power of the dark side would have been very helpful, but it didn't actually come out until they ended up fighting General Grievous. And uh, one mm-hmm. of them, their master almost died. The only real solution was to just embrace the power of the dark side and, you know, beat him away as best he could. Mm-hmm. I, it was a good campaign. Um, I mutilated some player characters, uh, they saved some people, met a few clones, and then because it's Saga Edition, which is based on D&D 3.5, uh, somebody showed up with an incredibly broken character that mm. I did not really vet properly. I just went, yeah, I'm sure that's probably fine. Uh, could not roll less than a 10 on any, like, less than a 10 on the die on any check. If it was less than a 10, it counted as a 10. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it was everything, like, everything Force-related, and because of the way feats work in that game, everything can be Force-related. So, you know, there's one good side and one bad side there. Right. So, well... Saga edition is bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I definitely have a couple avenues here. I, I want to ask some questions, but I, again, second to Star Wars, Chris is my my most knowledgeable Star Wars accompli- uh, you know, accomplice here. So what questions do you have, Chris? Uh, I mean, with players dropping in and out, what struggles did you have with that? Did you have to uh, introduce a new character, you know, almost every week or every episode, whatever you want to call it? It was it was very mission based. So like everything would start with here is a mission briefing. We have gathered you for. I didn't really go into the reasons because uh, right. you're you're the people available. It's the Clone Wars. Like you're the only people who are not currently engaged stabbing like some dude with four arms and six hundred lightsabers in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, but but there was a lack of like long term character arcs that I could really do. 
Like I did have some some players I could pretty consistently count on to be there. Uh, but like I said, you know, one one character's master never showed up again, and that got a little weird. Mm. Um, and everything had to be wrapped up within that like two to four hour slot we had for the game. So I couldn't do like long drawn out uh, campaigns on a single planet generally and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's I guess my my first thought would be that in a like a role playing game, like I think that works makes a lot of sense for like a TV show. You have like a guest star, basically. Somebody shows up, they may be the only time they're there, and you kind of make that episode about them in a way, like they're the new thing. We get to know, learn a lot about them. But in a campaign that you're like a game you're playing, in some ways that kind of slides against the people who are there all the time, who are the people who might be able to have a long-term arc. If you're constantly filtering in these guest stars who kind of get the spotlight, then they may not feel like they're getting their share, even though they're the ones that come every week. Did you did, did you have any instances of that, whether people vocalized it or just you saw that yourself? Uh, the problem was more the opposite, just because it was harder to really focus on the the people who hadn't been around as long. Okay. Um, they didn't have that established dynamic that everybody else had. Like, I was fairly hands-off for the role-playing stuff. But uh, once once a group of people kind of sets into that rhythm, because I had three people who showed up pretty consistently, once they settle into that rhythm, everybody else can feel a little locked out of it, I noticed. Mm. Okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah. All right. I, so one thing. Th oh, go ahead. So the three people that showed up, did their characters level up or do they just kind of? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they consistently leveled up. But I believe I tried to keep everybody roughly on the same, like, playing mm -hmm. on, the, on the same power level. Except for that one guy who she I didn't vet, uh, but that was that's a different yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we've all learned that lesson the hard way as a GM. <clears throat> you know, I've ran games and not looked at a character sheet and then realized the guy has you know all eight teens in his stats and you know he's you know what's the term Mary Sue at everything I think is the right term. And now I'm very specific of all right. Send me your character sheets every so often so I can kind of see them. I also do that, though, so I can see where their character strengths and weaknesses are. So as a GM, I can kind of plan to play with those because I like kind of pushing both buttons. Sometimes I like going, here you go, Michael. Here's a softball. Hit it out of the park. And there's other times I'm like, oh, here's a knuckle ball that you'll never be able to hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's... that's a, I think that's the right sports ball analogy. <laughs> I, I, I don't know it enough to correct you. So, <laughs> yeah. a hockey's my game as a Canadian, so I got nothing here. Yeah, uh, it's like a slap, yeah, slap shot versus a wrister. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of the things that again, just recently I had this. I went to a convention uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Origins, and like I like to think that I'm a pretty outgoing person most of the time. I have some introverted tendencies, and that's separate from this. Um, and I like to think I'm a pretty good role player. But I find that when I'm in a convention game that I am very quiet at first. Um, and I kind of try to figure out what is my role in like a meta stance in the game that I'm in. And, you know, sometimes it happens very quickly. Sometimes it takes a while. But like if there's someone else there that's like very outgoing and, and you know, exuberant and, and really good at role playing, I will happily fall into like a support role and try to set them up and give them their jokes. If I see someone is struggling a little bit and they're not as outgoing as, as my, I am or other people are, I will try to prod them. Um, you know, I, I, I hopefully I don't feel like I'm being overbearing, but I'll, I'll just like try to make sure I'm including them. Like if they don't, they're not vocalizing, I'll be like, what does Hawkeye think? And, you know, ask them their questions. Um, but I wonder in a case like that where you have people jump in and out, did you ever have that situation where someone jumped in, as you are saying, like they're new, they don't really know the dynamic. Do you think that affected their ability to role play right away? And if so, is there anything you would do differently if you tried, did something similar in the future? Uh, yeah, I had one buddy who, he, he was a pilot, so his schedule was super erratic, so he could only be there like once every six weeks or something. Um, and his character... His character was uh, more of an officer than a Jedi, uh, just because that was the kind of guy he, fe he felt like making. Um, he did have kind of a hard time getting along with these Jedi with their, like, mystic whatever. Like, it's kind of hard to play off of that if you're, A, not in the group super regularly, and B, are playing a character with a somewhat disparate background from that. Mm -hmm. Um I, I, think, I think next time I would probably mandate everybody makes Jedi would be my main thing. 
Uh, it's the Clone Wars. There's a lot of them. They'll die. You know. Mm -hmm. That's about all I got on that one. Okay. Uh, I like I, I you know did my best. I I set them up with some wonderful moments to shoot things with a blaster, and that's what counts. Exactly. Yeah, they get their moment. I'm just trying to think of like. Because you have a limited time frame, like, and that that's that's the thing is you're behind the clock the entire time. Uh, I know whenever I when I'm running a game, I almost always start with a introduction sort of thing, like tell me about your character, and like we start with like a role play scene where everybody's just talking to each other, or maybe it's like mid fight. We don't know how we're there, but we're role playing uh, to try to help people get into that right away. But you may not have always had that opportunity, and I don't know if it really fits. So I guess Chris, any thoughts on that? I know you've pretty much ran with the same groups, at least, you know, the Star Wars thing for a very long time. But you did have some guest yeah. stars occasionally, right, that would pop in. Mm -hmm. So did you ever experience that or have any suggestions on how to deal with that? I'm the new person. I don't know where I fit in yet situation. Uh, well, okay, so like with Redemption, no, because I usually had like an, a, a good meeting or chat with them beforehand going, here's the role that, you know, you're going to jump into. Here's kind of where I, I'd like your almost a co-GM in a way, like you're going to play this character, but the ultimate goal is for us to get to this point in the story. Play the character however you want to. So with that, it was a lot more kind of, I want to say directed, but led mm -hmm. in a way. Um, I look at what you're, kind of what you're talking about, more like just constantly running different convention games. And I do the same thing you do. You know, like, I, it's funny you say the Clone Wars, because I have one where, all right, there's five players, two of your Padawans, three of you aren't by the way you're a padawan you're a kid and you're in charge why are you in charge why are you working for the republic you know and we have this opening scene where now they you know you've got a 12 year old in charge of three adults how is that going to work and then i let them kind of interact and build it up from there how did you balance though like the the jedi and the non-jedi uh poorly for the most part <laughs> oh, fair enough <laughs> but it's the Clone Wars, so most of their opponents are like battle droids and stuff. You can't just force force wave your past or force mind trick your way past them. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of combat. Uh, the people who weren't force users tended to have long range attacks that the force users didn't, which gave okay. them a more kind of like clear cut uh, role. You know, mm -hmm. cover fire while the guys with the laser swords get up close and stab things really hard. Yeah, I just know that that's tough. Because anything, that, any character that can use the force generally in games is automatically better than somebody that can't. Yeah. Even if that's that character's specialty. Yeah, and that was especially bad with uh, Saga Edition because you could take a, a feat to let you use the for use your force check for pretty much any stat, like piloting, uh, that kind of stuff. I don't think slicing you could do with the force, but uh, I would not be surprised if that was in there somewhere. <laughs> There's a different feat for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Scurvy Knave uh, suggested that uh, you could have the regulars pick some sort of connection to the new character. So like a shared background or something to kind of help usher them into that relationship. That is a mm -hmm. good idea. I'm going to keep that one in mind, actually. Thank you. And Foxblade uh, mentions they love guest players. Uh, the players usually collect dozens of NPC allies, so I'm lucky to have a huge cadre of characters people can slot into. So, that again, that's not exactly what we're talking about here, but that is an interesting version of that where if you have someone who's like your out-of-state cousin who comes in for the weekend or a significant other doesn't always play and they want to play tonight, rather than making them create a new character to say like, okay, well, we've, we've got these three NPCs that have kind of been hanging around. Do you want to play one of them? Uh, and then that way they have the added responsibility trying to make sure they f play the character in a way that makes sense with what has happened before, but they also don't have to create a new character. You don't have to build new connections. You don't have to spend a lot of time on a character that may never get played again. So I, I like that quite a lot though. In general, I don't like it when my players collect NPC allies, but that's just a Michael thing. <laughs> Why you should say that actually uh my pilot buddy the character we got him to play so that he didn't have to like muck around creating like learning to create a character in a fairly jank system uh the character that we got him to play was somebody that they had actually sort of recruited from the empire uh the session before like yeah put a gun to his head and said either uh let us in and then join us or die horribly um in a more jedi way than that i i believe but so yeah. we just got him to play that guy that worked out <laughs> Yeah, it was nice. a lightsaber, not a gun. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Yes, it's an aggressive, uh, aggressive salary negotiations. Um, 
So the other thing, because I've I've done similar to this before. Uh, I've mentioned many times my t- my group in Cleveland. We played for many years, probably the longest continuing running campaign I've ever been in. But we would rotate GMs as well. But we also did the mission based thing where we were all part of like a mercenary guild, and each new session was a new adventure. But 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 we could extend it more than one session. It didn't have to be. You know, because it was the same group of people every time, but we switched GM, so not everyone had to DM the whole time. Um, so I've never done that with like literally people could jump in and out. Were these all people that were normally part of your game, or was it like an open like in a game store where people could have just literally stopped in? Uh, this was on Discord, so it was oh. like mostly our usual group, um, but with you know a, a few other friends of ours were kicking around there, and we just put out a call like an hour before, going, "Hey, you know, our normal game fell through. Anybody want to play Fragments?" Gotcha, gotcha. The only the only real problem with that was uh, when people wanted to play fragments more than whatever mm. else we were supposed to be doing. But uh... I know how that goes. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's it's exciting, but also sort of demoralizing when you're like, I have this campaign, and they would rather play this other thing that I don't spend as much time on, but for some reason they like it more. So what does that say about me? I anxiety, you know that type of thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's like the kid playing with the box the toy came in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you were excited to see them play with the toy and. Now you find yourself in the corner playing with the toy. See what? Yeah, that's what. That's my 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 uh, lesson there as an adult is I buy toys that I want to play with, and then when my kids play with a box, I get to play with the toy. So it, yeah. it, it was a win win. All right. So um, circling back. So other than maybe not playing that version of the game, uh, any <laughs> other big thoughts and advice for someone else who might want to do something similar? Either you know, and same thing is like a secondary we don't want to cancel a campaign or we just want to, we don't want to play out a game that it's built like that. So any other advice you'd have for someone doing something similar? Uh, yeah. Simplicity is your friend for scenarios. Like you, you may want to do big dramatic, uh, like character betrayals and stuff, but you really, you don't have the time. Um, mm-hmm. If there, if there is like a big, is this person our, our friend or not kind of thing, that should be the focus of the session. It cannot really be secondary. To whatever else is going on because again you have two to four hours to get all that across um also i rag on saga edition it's not that there's worse games out oh, there yeah. but uh you know <laughs> Several. Um, Several. yeah also vet like check characters uh check character sheets especially if your friend's like hey can you take a look at this you know just to make sure everything's okay that should have been should have been a sign i've got a note on their discord by uh discord like Profile, profile that just says you know make, make sure to always check <laughs> <laughs> not that they did anything wrong they right. went they ran it by me and everything i just it just didn't click because i was too rookie of a dm i mean even experienced dm that's one of the things that can slide because you you hope that they would know you know and if they if they're not sure they would question it but you know yeah it is and like is. if yeah if, if they're saying that to you maybe ask why they're so concerned instead of just looking at it and taking your best guess yeah just say, take it to Reddit. They'll tear it apart for you. Po- post it on Reddit and see what they say. <laughs> All right. So, Chris, any yeah. final thoughts or questions here before we move on? Um, I, I think the open table is a fun idea. I've only done it once, and that was at a game store that they were trying to build. And I ran one scenario for eight hours, and players, would, people would leave and come, somebody else would come sit down and, All right, here's who you're playing now, which is really just the same character somebody else was playing. So, I know the struggles of it, and I agree with you, simplicity. Keep it simple, keep the character simple, keep the interaction simple, and just relax with it. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for sharing, Carm. I really appreciate it. Uh, I didn't mention at the top, but just because we were on Star Wars so much, so much, I will mention that uh, Chris and I are actually working on a, a scenario together for a Dread game that mm-hmm. we're going to be a Star Wars Dread scenario that we're hoping to have ready for a Catacon this year. So hopefully people will be interested in that. I usually run the Scooby-Doo one, and I think it might be time to retire it. So I think I'm going to run it this year, but this might be the last year I'll run that one. We'll see. Uh, but I always have fun when I run it. I don't know why. It's, again, it's part of that anxiety. It's like I get anxiety for doing it, but once I do it, I have a lot of fun. All right, so we're going to move into our second improv game. This one is uh, Where Have My Fingers Been? This is where we're going to take turns, again, prompting each other to – uh, basically act out a short scenario that has two or more, if you're feeling froggy, uh, characters. So this is a scenario we make up, so you're not going to say like Macbeth, but you might say two people about to watch Macbeth type of a thing. Uh, Garm, again, you are the guest tonight. Would you like to go first in terms of prompting Chris or I, or would you like to go first and be prompted? 
Uh, I think I'll get prompted this time. All right. So there is a song that must be sung as part of our contract uh, obligations to New York Tater. So the song is Where Have My Fingers Been? I said, Where Have My Fingers Been? So please sing that song. Where have my fingers been? I said, Where have my fingers been? Your fingers are arguing over a character concept that appears to be broken and the other, the other person just doesn't want to admit it. <laughs> I think a force sensitive droid is totally fine and reasonable. That seems deeply disturbing. And also there's a, uh, why can't, why can't you fly with the force? Why can you do that? It's in the book. It's legitimate and reasonable. <laughs> I'm going to force smack you in the face <laughs> if you take this to my table. I'm still going to do it, and it's going to be worth it. That's, it. That's where your fingers have been. Very good. Excellent. Hey. All right, so just keep the train rolling. You will prompt Chris. Chris, you know how this goes. Right. Sing the song. Where have my fingers been? I said, where have my fingers been? Uh, Chris, your fingers are in a bunker being attacked by battle droids. Uh, they're still out there, aren't they? I don't know. You look. I'm not looking. You look. No, I said, wait. It's quiet. Maybe they left. Hey, did you guys leave? Roger, roger. Nope, I think they're still there. All right, now what do we do? Call a Jedi. That's a good idea. If only I could reach the radio that's in the other bunker. If only we had a Jedi, he could just bring it over here. What if we just surrender? Can we do that? I don't know. Let's ask. Hey, uh, can we surrender? Roger, roger. Huh, we surrender. Yay. <laughs> and that's where my fingers have been. <laughs> Did not see where that was going to end, but uh, very good job, sir. All yeah. right, so you will prompt me. Where have my fingers been? I said, where have my fingers been? Uh, you are meeting uh, yourself from another universe. Wow, you're me. Eh, I don't know. You're looking a little squirrely. Well, do you have that birthmark that I have, you know, in the place? Maybe. Be a little more descriptive. I don't want to, if you, if you knew, you would know. Uh, that's not going to work. Okay, well, classic Bill and Ted. What number? Everyone knows the joke. It's not funny if we say it. So that's not going to work. All right. So maybe we kiss. And that's where my fingers have been. Ew, yay. <laughs> fingers have been in some weird places. They've been some weird yeah. places. All right. So we're going to move into cryptozoology. And this is where we're going to take a look at a monster. It usually comes from D&D, but not always. We talk about ways that we have used this creature in the past, if we have. And we brainstorm some ways that we might use it in the future, if we would like. Garm, you again are the guest tonight. So what monster did you bring for us to talk about? Giant spider. Giant spider. spider. Spiders, spiders uh, are so cool. They are so underloved. Um yeah, no, spiders are, uh, biologically, they're fascinating. They don't have muscles. They just have, like, fluid, like, hydraulic joints. It's wild. So I tried to post a picture, but I think I don't have my layers correctly, so my apologies. I'm not going to mess with it because it will get too confusing. But I have a, I have a giant spider from the Dragon Bane game. Um, and I'm going to talk about that just for a moment, and then we'll get into like we, what we normally do. Um, I recently played Dragon Bane. I really liked it. I absolutely had a blast with that game, and I'm very looking forward to maybe playing it again. Uh, I'm actually playing it at Gen Con, but I'm wanting to, like, run it. Um, whoops. And I was, my, my it went, went away. Where did it go? No. That's a very nice picture of a giant spider. I don't know. I don't either. It disappeared. Look at the mandibles. It's I've got to pause so I can still see him, but. That is, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know where it went. Right, so there's the image, but I actually had the, um, the whole screen. I was going to, oh, did we, are we, for some reason yeah. you're offline. Ah, uh, okay. I think that's what happened. I think my internet went out for a second. Am it I back? Looks like it. Can you hear me? Oh, I we can hear you. Okay. Twitch just says you were offline. Okay. So it shows that we're back now. We're good. All right. I can see the giant spider and his wonderful mandibles. 
right. So yeah, I can't even get to the, it was on my email. So, all right, well, I'll, you talk, I'll work on this. So just Chris, have you ever used a giant right. spider before? Um, well, usually when people bring monsters to the show, I usually don't use them because I'm kind of boring. Uh, so this time um, I have used a giant spider. So for once I have a leg up in what we're going to talk about. Uh, 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 see, it's my dad joke for the day. I have to have at least one. Uh, so I have, I like to use spiders and giant spiders in a horror theme or scene. So, cause how many people sit around and go, Oh, I love the idea of a spider crawling up my leg or a giant spider climbing towards me. Like they're always seen as the dark, creepy, you know, giant thing walking at you and you can hear its mandibles clicking and you can see its feet and the hairs on it and, you know, all the eyes just staring at you and you can see the, the icker dripping off its fangs. You know, it builds a good scene for building that kind of creepy tension. So I like using them for that. Um, other than that, I, you know, I, I don't use them for like comic relief. I've seen some, I've run or played in games where all the players rode giant spiders like horses. And I just found that a little odd. You know, I use them more in the dark kind of way. How do you normally use them, Garm? Uh, unfortunately, the majority of my players hate anything with more than four legs and have a mm -hmm. fairly severe reaction to spiders or any anything in that vein. So I usually end up having to swap them out for some other kind of creature. Um, most of the time, this works fine. The only time I've had to just give up and narratively explain how a battle should have gone was when I was running a game called The Land of Eam where the mm -hmm. scenario was so, like, where the encounter, rather, was so reliant on it being a spider. I'm just like, there's a spider, you get webbed for a bit, you get out. Um, which is unfortunate, because, as I'm sure you've all put together, I really like spiders. They're fascinating. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm actually, we're playing Land of Beam on Monday. Oh, nice. Uh, it. I had fun with it. Uh, the creators are lovely people. They sent me a couple of uh, the first two volumes of the graphic novels. Um, yeah. What is it about spiders you find so fascinating? Uh, just, they're so weird compared to, like, most larger forms of life. Like I said, they don't have muscles. Um, it's just blood that they, like, squish into their parts to make their legs move. And as a result, their blood doesn't coagulate, because if it did, that wouldn't work. So if they get, like, cut even a little bit, they basically, they bleed out. And the compound eyes are crazy looking. And I'm sorry to anybody who, uh... I, I, I sent this link to who is now listening to me talk about how much uh, I like spiders that they hate. Um, but they're just so weird and alien compared to most things. Like, it's the kind of thing you normally find in, like, the deep sea in terms of how alien it is. But it's right there on land and in Australia. And, um, yeah, I'm from a place with no poisonous ones. Otherwise, I might feel a bit differently. I, I like spiders yeah. because... I think a lot of people have a natural aversion to spiders. So the the idea of... You know, not even like the monstrous ones that are like bigger than a horse, but just like a dog-sized spider, I'm dead. Yeah. Like I'm not surviving that. If I if I if I walk mm -hmm. out this door and there's a there's a German Shepherd-sized spider, I die. And so when you, I think it's easy to elicit a, a response of like fear and and revulsion, and it helps with the immersion of where are these fantasy, you know creatures or whatever these fighters and we're fighting this thing i just think it's a natural connection that it, the reality bleeds over now there are some people like garm who are weirdos who like spiders but for the most <laughs> part i think you can get a pretty easy like connection to what you want the players and characters to feel so i think that's one reason why i because i use them quite a lot i also think they're just a good entry like level one, two, three encounter. They're big, they're hairy, they're dangerous, but they're not too deadly. You can always choose as the DM to like web them rather than bite them. So you don't kill characters right away. Uh, you get to do cool things like I'm going for a leg or, or you try to rock, roll under it and stab up. So you can create these sort of cinematic style battles fighting a creature that everyone understands where if you're like, it's a gibbering mouther. What is that? I don't know. It's a pile of play-doh with a bunch of mouths uh that's talking to you in your head so i, I just yeah. think it's an easy way to kind of connect the dots for people 
I wonder if my affection for them comes from uh, the fact that my first experience with like fictional giant spiders comes from the anime Spider Riders, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's mm -hmm. fantasy adventures with people who ride armored spiders and fight stuff uh, rather than like um, the one from Lord of the Rings or that kind of stuff. Or the, yeah. The Wild Wild, Wild West. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> the giant <laughs> robo spider. Yeah. For a, a brief period of time, we were uh, playing around with a new podcast, which I really liked, but unfortunately, for various reasons, it didn't go on. It was called Summon Monster 3. And you can still listen to it. There's like five episodes on our feed. And it was me, Ryan, and Caleb. And the idea is that we were going to take monsters, kind of like basically it's going to take cryptozoology and make like an entire show out of it. And we did an episode on spiders. And the idea is that we want to try to come up with like an encounter that a DM could steal. So I'm just going to steal that one because I thought it was very cool. We came up with the idea where basically it was a, almost like a puppeteer. And so the player characters would come into like a, like a feast hall and there would be all these bodies that look like they're zombies, like zombified knights and servers, and they would be fighting and it would only come during the battle. You'd start to see that actually they're, they're not zombies, they're marionettes. And there's like these fine spider webs that are controlling them. And then there was like a spider mastermind literally behind the scenes, puppeteering all these different things that you were fighting. And I think that was just kind of an interesting you know, way to use a giant spider in a different way. So that's, that's the one I would say for future use, borrow that one and go with it as you will. That's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's creepy. I'm sure it hits the creepy fact. <laughs> <laughs> creepy. Yeah. Factor just seven. a slow, slow realization that like they're moving in an unnatural way, but not the normal unnatural right. way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like thriller unnatural, like, like what are we talking about here? Um, <laughs> So, Chris, any other thoughts on how we could use a monster, like a giant spider in the future? Uh, like I said, I've always just used them for the creepy factor. I was trying to think of a way to make them not as creepy, but they're just hairy things with fangs that try to eat everything. So I really can't come up with anything not creepy. Make it a friend. Make it mm. metaphorical. You know, maybe instead of pulling on literal webs, it manipulates people's minds, like pulling the threads of society to its own. Uh, I, was, I was going for friend, but we ended up straight and sinister again. Uh, yeah. Isn't that yeah. the, the well, Game of Thrones character, Varus, is the spider pulling? Yeah, that, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I, I remember when Game of Thrones was around. And, and good. <laughs> uh, but I also like, uh, I do like trying seven, to create encounters where it's not always just kill everything. I mean, obviously, it's spider venom maybe you're fighting a foe that can only be killed by spider venom so you have to go out and milk uh, a giant spider to get to coat your weapon so you're not you don't want to kill the spider because it's a natural part of this habitat and you don't want to do that but you need its venom uh, so that could be an interesting way about it mm -hmm. uh it could be maybe it's like a uh invasive species situation where like like a wizard wizard did it you know a wizard had a spider got out now it's repopulating and you need to like re you don't want to kill them you got to relocate them so you got to capture it and then like take it across the desert and you know that type of thing so it's not just hitting it with a stick till it dies but there, but you have to do the fact that it's a giant effing spider uh that if it gets out it doesn't know that you're trying to protect it it's going to eat you uh, how do you feed it while you're you know tra traveling across the desert that kind of thing I like the idea of the giant spider rampaging across the land after escaping from like a circus or something like the, uh, the lion in red dead redemption too. Uh, scurvy knave says, give it a top hat problem solved. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Get a little cane. Yeah. Sing Hello, my darling. Hello. That, that's a frog. Never mind. Yeah. Also the yeah. fact that they build things is super cool. <laughs> like the webs and stuff. It's, it's neat. It's, it's, it's neat. That's all I got. <laughs> but you, you could have a, a mastermind spider that sends out smaller spiders to spy on the world. And it's, like you said, kind of pulling the strings of society to keep things flowing the way it wants to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you could have uh, like little earworm spiders. They crawl in your head and then, then the master spider pulls the string like a marionette, but it's like a mm -hmm. mind control situation. Yeah. Kind of like uh, Avaros in, um, uh, the dragon prince stuff with the little like centipede that crawls on a dude's ear and whispers in there, you know, dark sinister temptations. Yeah. That's yeah. creepy. You could have Charlotte just spelling out things in a spider web, like some pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The friendly one that's trying to help. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, you got Aragog from Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling's a piece of crap, but uh, yep. it's a good story. It's going to endure. Um, so, but you know, so you have this spider who has knowledge. It's an ancient live, you know, lived species. Whatever. It's got information from a past age. Um, maybe even that's like a. I'm thinking like almost like a weird situation where if a spider like bites a person, it retains part of their essence. And so we need the spider to bite me now so that I can get that essence or we, you know, we're, we're milking it not for venom, but for memories. You have like a memory spider. I don't know. You can do something with mm-hmm. that. I wonder, I wonder if you could weave webs intricately enough to make like effectively pages in a book. Ooh. I'm reading sure. the, the horrible web book. <laughs> it's gross. Yes. It, all these pages are stuck together. It's not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you could even try to, you know, you're rebuilding a city and the spiders, their, their webs are, you know, super strong. They would be helpful to help rebuild things. So yeah, it's like the tensile a, strength of, yeah. So instead of like, like those new robots that like 3D print concrete buildings, you could have spiders mm-hmm. building, build, human buildings, but they're made out of a spider web that hardens through a magical process. So, you know, you could have this like <laughs> glimmering city that looks like it's made out of glass, but it's actually hardened spider webs that's yeah. sick i like that that's a that is a, a weird place that players will either love or hate yeah i mean you just go there it's like there's just and it's not like overwhelming at first like it's an abandoned city of course so it's like perfectly shiny and shimmering it looks like it's you know kept clean but there's just a lot of spiders like it's just the only thing there's everywhere you look there's a little bit of spiders it, hopefully it's not obvious at first but over time they realize that and there's maybe there's a giant spider on the inside or or something again it may not even be like sinister it could just be like what happened to the people maybe there used to be a uh not a like a species or a clan of people who had spiders as companions uh and they all got killed but the spiders remained and again come back to spider riders saying like we're trying to rebuild the spider riders (laughs) i don't know Interesting, though. Uh, but as always, we'll throw it out to the audience, anyone listening now or in the future. If you have any interesting ways that you could use spiders or you have used them in interesting ways or you think of some new ones you want to share, please do. I really wanted to share the Forbidden Lands and Dragon Bane, but I, I don't know what happened. I, it's gone. Uh, so maybe we'll do that next time. But we're going to move on to the end of the show. This is our audience Q&A. So if anyone who is still watching wants to have any questions that for us to answer, should probably be gaming related, but doesn't really have to be. But we reserve the right to refuse to answer something if we don't want to. Uh, we know there's a little bit of a delay, so while we're waiting for things to catch up, we'll go around the horn one more time. Garm, tell people where they can find you if they want to listen to your shows or find you or online, whatever. Where can they do that? Uh, yeah, you can find my shows at uh, Midgardia RPG on YouTube. M-I-D-G-A-R-D-I-A RPG. A little bit hard to spell, I know. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, as long as that still exists, at GarmBreak1. Uh, also, I know I'm supposed to be shilling myself, but if you're medically able, please donate blood. There's always a shortage. It's really important, and there's always a shortage. And spiders and, uh, are cool. And spiders are cool. <laughs> That's also true. Awesome. Do not get spiders in your blood. You don't want that. Ooh, spider blood. That's my message. Yeah. All right, Chris, where can people find you? Uh, I still am on Twitter, Burlu underscore Chris. Find me here every other Wednesday. Uh, doing Smuggler's Blues, which is the continuation of Redemption every other Monday, and then the Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen every other Thursday. This time I didn't say Shadow of the Demon Lord. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's pretty much where you can find me. All right. Uh, you can find me at the RPG Academy pretty much anywhere. Um, I'm not on threads. I don't plan on being on threads. I did get a, a blue sky invite. I'm not special. I knew somebody who was, and they gave me one very kindly. I'm there. Uh, if I go anywhere, it's probably going to be blue sky and I may just not go anywhere. Like I, my days on Twitter are numbered. And when I leave there, I might just leave everywhere. I don't know yet. Uh, but anywhere you search the RPG Academy, if you find something, it should be me. Uh, We do a show called uh, The Sample Adventures, which we do basically every other Monday off of the Smuggler's Smuggler's Blue schedule, where we stream brand new games that we've never played before. Um, Sorry. Um, And we play through the sample adventure that's included in the core book or the quick start. And so this Monday, we're going to play The Land of Eam from their quick start. So it is the curse of the chicken foot, witch is what we will be playing. Uh, I'd never played land of Eam before I'm running it. I've read through it. It's basically a D 12 system. 
so I love it right off the bat. But it's the it is sold as the Muppets meets Lord of the Rings with a little bit of Mad Max thrown in the middle. Uh, so if that sounds fun, mm-hmm. join us next Monday, roughly 7 p.m. Eastern. And if that doesn't float your boat, we have plenty of other ones, audio only, and also some on YouTube that gets uh, checked over or gets converted over. So no questions have come in. So we'll ask Garm the one question we ask all of our guests. Uh, and that is, imagine you were being turned into a action figure. I don't mean like a wizard has cast a spell, but like they've come to you and said, hey, Garm, we want to make an action figure. What are the three accessories that will come with your action figure? Man, does realistic hair count as an accessory? Because uh, that's always been my favorite from the G.I. Joe line. It can be. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go with uh, the realistic hair. Okay. Um, a, a, a full, an energy drink that, okay. because I have a horrific caffeine addiction. Um, <laughs> uh, and something hexagonal shape. I, I love hexagons. Uh, let's go with the hexagonal base so I stay upright. Okay. That works for me. Uh, Skip Drip just says, good show. See you next time. Thank you for hanging out with us. I really appreciate it. Garm, thank you so much for being here. I had an absolute blast hanging out with you again. Also, again, thank you for having me on your show for Action 12 Cinema. One more time, where can people find your show? Uh, at Midgardia RPG on YouTube. If you look up Cool Crowdfunding or Creator Corner, uh, that should turn up one of my two programs, hopefully the one you typed. Right, and uh, I'll put the links in the show notes to make it easy as well. Uh, Chris, any final words or thoughts before we sign off? Drive me on Diablo 4. Mm. How does that work? Do you have a name? Do you have a gamer tag? Like if somebody wanted to play with you, how do they do that? Uh, you have to get a battle net name and then just find me on the Discord channel here and let me know you're playing and then we can link up because I forget how to do it. I have to go in every time and remember. Fair enough. Uh, and then I will just simply say, remember, folks, if you're having fun. You're doing it right. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.